Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Peter Stanton, the publisher of the Worcester Business Journal, uh, and your host for today's session on PPP funding and year-end financial planning strategies during this pandemic year. Um, CARES Act, through its Paycheck Protection Program and other loan program incentives, was designed to help small businesses get through the economic shock of the pandemic. While that shock is not over, the PPP and other programs are winding down, and many businesses who receive loans through these programs want to get their loans, loan forgiveness paperwork in and approved. While the system is moving ahead, there is still some lack of clarity when it comes to qualifying for that forgiveness. And there are also a number of year-end tax planning issues that small businesses need to be aware of as this year comes to a close. For those still struggling to get through the pandemic, understanding how that those CARES Act loan programs and incentives affect your taxes is critical, both on the federal and the state level. This morning, we have a terrific panel of experts who will give us an overview on the latest information you'll need to know as you prepare to close the books on 2020. The session is part of our COVID-19 crisis webcast series and is brought to you by our two presenting sponsors, Webster Five and Fallon Health. We appreciate the leadership and commitment to our community from both these fine organizations. Their support allows us to deliver high quality programs like this one at no charge to attendees. A recording of this webcast will be made available online at the Worcester Business Journal's website. So you'll be able to send a link to anyone who could not join us live this morning. Our four panelists for today's session bring a varied background and perspective to the conversation. So after introducing them individually, each will give us an overview of how they are working with clients to help understand and process their PPP loans, as well as working with them on tax planning issues in this very unique year. So we have with us today, first, uh, Sandra O'Neill. Sandra is an attorney and tax partner at Bowditch and Dewey. Good morning, Sandra. Good morning, thank you. Um, and next, we have a pair of uh, Bloom Shapiro, uh, a team from Bloom Shapiro, um, Alan Osmolowski, who's the industry partner leader uh, at Bloom Shapiro's TLC service group. Morning, Alan. Good morning. Thank you. Um, and Jason Correa, who is a director at Bloom Shapiro. Nice to have you with us, Jason. Hey, good morning, everybody. And, uh, and next, we, also, we have Chris Watson. And if you've watched some of these PPP programs, Chris has been one of our guides as we, uh, as we make it through this, this process of uh, getting the money and, and hopefully getting the money uh, forgiven. Uh, Chris is a senior VP and senior lending, lending officer of business banking at Webster Five. Chris, nice to have you with us. Good morning, thank you. So uh, our first uh, presenter is gonna be Sandra O'Neill. And uh, so Sandra, why don't you get us started? Great, well, thank you so much. Um, I know everyone has been very focused on, in particular, the PPP loan, but the CARES Act and the Families First Coronavirus Response Act did include a number of other tax incentives um, to consider as you're closing the books and, and you know, ultimately filing tax returns uh, for 2020. Um, so perhaps the, the next slide. Thank you. Um, so first, the CARES Act. For those uh, businesses who did not uh, seek a payroll protection and loan, um, the CARES Act also did include a $5,000 refundable payroll tax credit for employers whose operations were fully or partially suspended due to COVID shutdowns or gross receipts declined by more than 50% um, when compared to the same quarter in the prior year. And um, the act gives the credit for businesses with more than 100 employees um, just per employee affected by the COVID shutdown. But with fewer than 100 employees, uh, um, the credit is for all employees. Um, so something to consider if, if uh, your business was not, uh, did not apply for a, a PPP loan. Um, separately, 
uh, the family's first coronavirus response act did include family and sick leave tax credits. Um, this law required businesses to provide sick leave and uh, paid leave for employees impacted by uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic. However, it also provided employment tax credits to employees with that were covered with more than 50 employees and fewer than 500 employees um, to cover the cost of providing such sick leave. And so um, it, it works out to a full payment at about $5,000 for first two weeks of paid sick leave for any employee who had COVID and had to take sick leave. And then in addition, two weeks of paid sick, sick leave at two thirds pay um, for a total of $2,000 per employee for employees who had to take sick leave to, to provide care to family members who were impacted by COVID. Um, and that included for family, for children who were stuck at home at, without schooling. And then further an additional 10 weeks of um, leave uh, paid for by the employer um, for a total of $10,000 at employee tax credit to cover that leave for families impacted by COVID um, who needed, for example, to take care of children uh, at home because of the pandemic. So, you know, these two employment tax credits um, were offered, and it would be interesting to hear from various employers, the people on the call, you know, if they are aware of these credits or have uh, worked to take advantage of them. Um, separately, the, the CARES Act did help uh, relieve some limitations on losses that were enacted under the 2017 Tax Reform Act. So um, it is possible if you are a business to look at um, if you had losses in the past, for example, after 2017, those losses were limited. Now with the CARES Act, you're able to say amend your past tax returns to access completely those losses or carry back existing losses to past year's return and possibly get a tax refund. The CARES Act also increased the limitation on business interest expense deductions um, from 30% to 50% of adjustable tax income. So that also, if you have interest on loans, you know, it's something to look at, uh, perhaps, a, a, um, you know, working on, on the 2020 uh, tax year tax return. Um, the 2017 Tax Reform Act had repealed the alternative minimum tax and provided a, a credit um, in future years against past uh, alternative minimum tax payments. And uh, the CARES Act accelerates the credit by making it refundable this year for, for past years. Uh, and the CARES Act also allows taxpayers who made improvements on property to apply bonus depreciation uh, to such qualified improvement property. So, you know, lots of little things to look at, perhaps with your accountant, um, look at, you know, past years and this year to see if you can get additional tax uh, relief. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, one thing also to keep in mind, this was not enacted by the CARES Act, but um, Section 165I of the code allows taxpayers to deduct any losses incurring in a disaster area in the current year or the previous year. And with the coronavirus pandemic, that was President Trump issued an emergency declaration that made the crisis qualify as a federally declared disaster. So that is another provision to examine if you are, for example, a retailer and suffered losses because of the disaster, you were not able to sell your product, um, you know, you could seek to deduct the losses from this year in a previous year and also get a refund. Um, you know, one of the things that the 2017 Tax Reform Act did was uh, enact uh, legislation to encourage qualified opportunity funds 
um, which allows uh, investors to defer gains from the sale of property if they reinvest in a so-called qualified opportunity fund. Um, and you know, with the pandemic, the IRS has issued a notice to allow some relief to um, extend, you know, to make an investment by the end of this year, essentially, um, and receive deferral. So if you, uh, you know, Chris, it'd be interesting to hear if, if you have any clients or who are looking at qualified opportunity funds and, and, and perhaps they could take advantage of this provision. And, and finally, for nonprofits, I know I've had a number of clients who have reached out to, um, you know, solicit contributions and the CARES Act did um, encourage charitable giving by allowing for this year additional tax benefits to for charitable contributions for, uh, you know, $300 for individuals who take the standard deduction and then no limitation on itemized deductions for those who itemize deductions. And it also reduced the limitation on deductions for corporate charitable contributions. So that is something, you know, as there's always an end of year push for charitable donations to consider um, that the CARES Act does encourage additional charitable giving. Um, next slide. So another, you know, things to consider as uh, employers in, in Massachusetts, of course, a number of employers now have remote workers and um, you know some of these employees I know we had clients who faced questions when employees were stuck in other states working from home what does that mean from a, a, you know a filing uh, tax consequence and payroll tax consequence well Massachusetts has, has said that you know they will not consider the presence um, of one or more employees working remotely in Massachusetts from you know other state employers to require, say, a, a tax filing in Massachusetts for to establish corporate nexus. Um, in addition, Massachusetts did uh, promulgate emergency regulations saying that for Massachusetts employers that have employees working remotely outside of the state, those employers can still withhold Massachusetts payroll taxes um, for those employees. Um, and, you know, which is perhaps more administrative easier for Massachusetts employees. They did say that, however, that if you have an employee who is required to pay uh, payroll taxes or, or rather income taxes in another state um, because they're residing there, that Massachusetts will not require the employer to withhold payroll taxes in Massachusetts for those employees. Um, you know, one thing to note, the state of New Hampshire has challenged the constitutionality of these emergency regulations um, because, of course, the number of people who reside in New Hampshire, they don't pay state income taxes. So, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how that proceeds in court. The, the regulations now are only through the end of the year. So, you know, I think it's still up in the air what happens next year with people still working remotely. Um, so really, you know, that's it. I think just in conclusion, you know, it, I know that the PPP has created some frustration um, with the tax treatment, but it is something to consider to comb through the, the other legislative provisions of the CARES Act um, with your accountant to see, you know, what other tax relief might be available uh, to your business. So thank you. Thanks, Sandra. That's a great summary of, uh, uh, I know that PPP is our 800 pound gorilla, right? But there's a lot of other options out there in the law that, uh, that can be taken advantage of. So that's a great summary. Thank you. Thank and so you. next, uh, uh, We've got uh, Jason Correa, who's going to uh, give us his uh, his view, and we want to give him a nod for his uh, Patriots Gronkowski jersey in the background. We kind of <laughs> see the eight. There's a seven right next to it when he moves his head a little. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so uh, it's, a it's a tough year to be a Patriots fan. But <laughs> we've been they pretty won yesterday, though, right? <laughs> they did. They're, they're hanging in there barely. Okay, Jason, it's all yours. So <clears throat> thanks, Peter. Um, so, you know, one of the first things I wanted to talk about was just the timing of, of the forgiveness, because I, I think that's been one of the biggest questions I've gotten from a lot of my clients is, you know, do I have to apply by year end? When do I have to get my application in? Um, and so, you know, to clarify, you do have 10 months from the end of your covered period to get your application into, the, into your lender. Um, so that means if, you know, if you use the 24-week period that ended on October 15th, you have 10 months from that date 
to actually submit your application to your bank before you have to start making payments. Um, so just one thing to, to emphasize, because I know there's a big push to get the applications in before the end of the year. A lot of people want to get it over with, which I certainly understand. Um, but just knowing that you, you do have you do have more time than you realize to, to get the application in. Um, and the other thing in terms of timing, you know, everybody's asking, you know, even once they do have their applications ready, when am I going to hear back? And, you know, the answer is, unfortunately, you need to have a little bit of patience, you know, as I'm sure Chris can speak to, you know, the banks have 60 days to do their review. And then the SBA still has 90 days on the back end to complete their part of the process. So for those who, you know, are, are thinking that they want to get the application in before the end of the year, know that you're not going to hear back until 2021. It, it's, it's going to take you know, at least a couple months for, for the review process to kind of run its course. And then the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, for all loans over $2 million, those loans are going to be subject to audit by the SBA. Um, they've come out and said, you know, essentially anything over that threshold will, will be audited 100%. Any loan below that threshold, they can still audit at their discretion. They've kind of given themselves a six-year window to audit these loans. Um, so know that even you know, even though you get forgiveness, you're kind of not out of the woods yet. And even if you're below $2 million, the SBA do, does have the right to come back and, and audit your loan if you want. So uh, sorry, if they want. So it's important to just make sure you maintain all the documentation. Um, you know, I've, I have a lot of clients who have CFOs that are transitioning, you know, think they're going to be retiring the next year or two. And it's important to make sure that you, you kind of keep an audit file uh, of everything, especially if you're going to have, you know, a new CFO in place who who may not have been involved now during the forgiveness, uh, that if the SBA comes back four years from now, you'll be able to handle that you know, without any issues. The other, I guess, elephant in the room right now is definitely the, the questionnaire on economic need uh, that was released a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, one thing I want to emphasize is that at least as of right now, you know, I know the, the questionnaire has begun to you know, be circulated it was in a review period for the SBA that I believe ended right before the holiday. Uh, but if you go on the SBA's website to this point, there's still no final version of, of the form that's been posted. I know it's already begun to kind of be circulated and, and you know, Kristen speak to this as well. I, I think some of my clients have started to receive it from their bank. So I think our understanding is that it, at this point it, it's mostly finalized or there you know, shouldn't be any major changes to it. Uh, and it kind of includes you know, questions that range from a lot of simple yes, no questions to more you know, specific quantitative measures on you know, your actual business activities, uh, whether you're a for-profit or nonprofit entity, and then talking about kind of what your liquidity assessment was. You know, did you have uh, other capital available to you? Um, and, and I think what I, what I really wanna emphasize is that a lot of our clients, when they first heard about this, you know, obviously there was a lot of concern, just a lot, a lot of questions about, you know, the unknown of, of what the questionnaire was and ultimately how the SBA was going to utilize it. And in the conversations we've had with the SBA, you know, the, the message has been that at this point, it's a way for them to get information uh, and, and do so more quickly. You know, our initial thought was that the, uh, the economic need certification was going to be part of the SBA's audit process when they came back, you know, to say two years from now to look at these loans. And the message we're getting is that they want to try to do more of that work up front for the loans over $2 million before they make their initial assessment. And then they'll, they'll still come back and do a more detailed audit, but they're trying to gather more information. So um, I guess that's just to say, you know, try not to be too, uh, too stressed out about this at, at this point. There's no clear black and white of, you know, if, if you have certain criteria, they're going to decide that you can't be eligible for forgiveness. You know, I think the SBA has, has made it clear, at least in the conversations we've had with them, that they're still going to look at every situation, you know, individually, um, you know, this, because there's a lot of factors. This, again, this is just a way for them to get more information on your circumstances uh, when they do the initial review of your loan, um, or at least, you know, if the loan has already been forgiven, um, you know, some, some of our clients have been asked to fill this out afterwards, but again, it's a way for the SBA to, to get that information more quickly. And from a timing perspective, you know, one thing to keep in mind that's important is when you receive this questionnaire from your bank, you only have 10 business days to actually complete and, and send it back. So a lot of my clients, I've been suggesting to them, even if they haven't received it yet, 
to start pulling together the responses and the information just to make sure that you, you can get it done in a timely fashion. Uh, and again, this is something that's at this point is only required for loans over $2 million. But I do want to point out that, you know, again, the SBA can still come back and audit loans below that threshold. And, and that includes looking at the economic need. So uh, again, I've suggested to some of my clients that are below the $2 million threshold that even though they don't need to fill this out for their bank, it's probably worth them reviewing the questionnaire and just looking at some of the questions and kind of starting to have a sense of, uh, you know, how, how they would answer the questions or what information they would need to pull together if the SBA either changed course and, and lowered the threshold or did come back during an audit process and, and asked them some of these questions to, to verify their economic need for the loan. Next slide. And then in terms of kind of what versions of the, the applications are out there, it's another big question I've been getting from my clients. You know, can I use the EZ form? You know, which version do I use when I, when I send it to my bank or when I go on their, on their web portal? Um, there are three different versions, you know, for any borrower who has a loan below $50,000, they released, uh, time is kind of relative now. It feels like a couple of weeks ago, but it may have been longer. Um, they released a version called the 3058S, which is really just a, 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 a simple one-page certification where you, you really just certify they use the funds appropriately and, and can apply for full forgiveness. Uh, so again, it's, it's a simple form for loans under $50,000. Um, the easy form is available to borrowers. There's no, you know, no threshold or no cap on, on that form. The only criteria are that you, you have to meet the eligibility, which is, you know, either that you did not have any reduction in your FTE headcount from January 1st of 2020 to the end of your cover period, um, and that you did not reduce any, anyone's salary or, or hourly wage by more than 25%. Or the other criteria is if you are in an industry that was significantly impacted by, you know, by, by COVID from, the, uh, from an operational standpoint where you had to be shut down due to social distancing or, or health guidelines, um, you know, obviously industries like restaurants and hospitality, those are, you know, immediately come to mind, but there are others as well. Um, if, if you meet that safe harbor, then you can also utilize the the easy form, even if you did have reductions, because um, those were kind of forced upon you due to health health restrictions. Uh, and then if all else fails, you, you know, you, you may need to just fill out the full form. Um, you know, what, what I found is that's applicable for a lot of my clients because they, they did have to make temporary furloughs in their workforce, you know, when COVID first hit. And then once they got the PPP funds, they brought folks back on. But because of that, you know, temporary reduction in their headcount, they have to use the full form and, and fill out the PPP Schedule A. Um, again, not, none of these alter, you know, the, the approach or in, or in terms of applying for forgiveness, just changes uh, really just the amount of information that you need to provide to your bank initially. And next slide, I think that I think that's it for me. So now I'll, I'll turn it over to Alan and, and he can speak to uh, some of the tax, tax implications. Thanks, Jason. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the issues that um, uh, you need to think about currently are the tax implications of PPP loan forgiveness. Uh, when the CARES Act was first passed, um, uh, the Senate bill made it very clear that they didn't want the forgiveness of a PPP loan to be taxable income. Uh, so, you know, typically, uh, if you're a taxpayer and you have a, a debt and it's forgiven, that's forgiveness of indebtedness income that becomes taxable income to you. So in the uh, you know, original Senate bill, they made it very clear they didn't want uh, a PPP loan to be forgiveness of indebtedness income. And then in May of this year, the IRS came out and said, well, wait a minute, there's another part of the tax code that says um, if you are reimbursed for a, an expense, you really can't take a tax deduction for that. And that aspect of the tax code was not addressed in the original Senate bill. Um, and uh, most recently, the IRS issued uh, Rev Ruling 2020-27 uh, um, on November 18th that um, basically you know, reiterates the IRS position on this, that uh, if you are receiving a reimbursement for an expense, 
then you can't claim a deduction for that expense, which in effect makes the forgiveness of a PPP loan uh, taxable income, which was never what was intended by, by Congress. And uh, there's been a lot of you know, issues around that. You know, what if you have applied for loan forgiveness and haven't actually had that loan forgiven? Well, the position um, in Rev Ruling 2027 uh, is that if you have a reasonable expectation that your PPP loan will be forgiven at some point, um, under current law as it stands today, you can't claim a deduction for those expenses that would otherwise be uh, reimbursed by the PPP loan proceeds, um, which uh, in effect, um, in many cases, will make the forgiveness of a PPP loan taxable. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, there is another revenue procedure that was issued that says, if you are not going to apply for loan forgiveness or loan forgiveness has been denied, then you are able to claim a tax deduction for those uh, expenses that are related to, uh, you know, payroll, rent, et cetera. Um, haven't seen a lot of this. We had a, you know, this group was talking earlier before the call. It seems like most of our clients that have applied for loan forgiveness are receiving a uh, loan forgiveness by the uh, SBA. But if in fact you don't think that you would be able to qualify for loan forgiveness, then you are able to claim a deduction for those expenses. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the question is, you know, the, it, it, was, it was never the intention of Congress for a uh, recipient of a PPP loan to have taxable income. And uh, back in May, in a very rare um, bipartisan um, effort, uh, uh, Senate Finance Committee Chuck Grassley is a Republican and ranking member of the Senate, uh, Ron Wyden, who's a Democrat, both wrote a letter um, to uh, Mnuchin uh, saying that, uh, you know, the Treasury is ignoring congressional intent by these positions that they've, they've said. And so um, the IRS has come back and said, yeah, okay, we, we uh, get it, but in order to fix this, we needed a, a tax bill. And so it, it seems that there's bipartisan support for a legislative fix to uh, correct the situation so that a, uh, a taxpayer who's received a PPP loan forgiveness um, from the SBA can still claim a tax deduction for those expenses that were, you know, being reimbursed, which was the intention of Congress. But there needs to be a, a bill that gets passed in Congress to make that happen currently. And uh, it's, it's a question of when and how that will happen. You know, now that we're sort of past the elections and uh, there's, you know, a, a lot of talk about the um, a next round of, you know, economic relief bill uh, the thinking is hopefully as part of, you know, the next round of economic relief as part of that bill, there'll be something in there that is a legislative fix to this particular issue. Um, but we, we, we don't know at this point exactly when that would be. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, so without a legislative fix, uh, there's potentially, you know, $120 uh, billion of additional taxes that will be incurred by uh, businesses of all sizes. Um, which is not something that was ever intended and would be a, um, you know, a, a, a unintended consequence of, of this current situation we're in. Um, you know, hopefully we'll see something happen before the March, April timeframe when uh, a business has to start filing their tax returns so they can give out tax implications. But sort of our position is that if we don't have a tax bill with a legislative fix, you know, by the March, April timeframe, uh, it's probably a good year to think about filing an extension, and uh, hopefully we'll see something, you know, before the extended due date. Um, you know, but, but again, the general thinking is that there'll there'll be something that'll happen to fix this. We just don't know when. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as as Jason mentioned, uh, you know, the SBA has reserved the right to do uh, an audit of loans um, uh, for uh, six years. Uh, from the date of forgiveness. Um, and the general the statute of limitations for filing a, an amended tax return is, uh, is three years. So you could be potentially, you know, a situation in theory, you could be four or five years down the road, the statute is closed for your um, uh, ability to amend a tax return. Um, but, you know, potentially the um, SBA could come in and, and deny all or part of your loan forgiveness 
And uh, under, you know, again, under current law, there was expenses that you were unable to take. So um, as things unfold here, we'll see where it goes, but there may be um, something to think about relative to filing a protective refund claim to keep the statute of, of limitations open for filing an amended tax return beyond that three year period to kind of coincide with a six year statute that uh, the SBA has. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I think, you know, we've seen a, a lot of M&A activity kind of put in the back burner um, relative to what's happening where it has happened with COVID. Uh, a lot of those deals are now gaining more traction and we're seeing things start moving forward. Um, one of the issues we have to uh, think about is that if a um, company has an outstanding uh, PPP loan and there is going to be a, a transaction that involves a significant change in ownership or change in assets, um, that, that uh, PPP loan that has not yet been forgiven needs to be addressed. And in many cases, what has to happen is there has to be an escrow put aside for that uh, PPP loan. And um, you know, that's just a, a, another aspect of, uh, of managing through uh, an M&A transaction uh, with a entity that has an outstanding uh, PPP loan. Uh, next slide, please. And that is everything I have, thank you. Okay, thanks, Alan. And um, we're gonna wrap up the presentation part with uh, Chris Watson, who is sitting, I think at Command Central inside of a bank, right? Where, <laughs> where uh, a lot of the professionals are advising their clients and uh, uh, Chris, you're sort of uh, there um, in the processing loans. And so can you share with us what, uh, what you're seeing uh, for your clients? Uh, yeah, certainly can. Um, and thank you, uh, Peter, for having me. This I think this is actually the third time uh, we've uh, met on this subject. It's uh, ever-changing. Uh, it's a very fluid process. Um, and, you know, I guess what I'd say is obviously the forgiveness process is, is well underway um, with the SBA. And, and thus far, from our perspective anyway, it seems to be working. Um, we're getting tranches uh, weekly from uh, the applications we've submitted. We've submitted um, uh, close to 200 uh, completed applications and got paid uh, on over, uh, well over 100 of them at this point. Uh, I wish I could say that there's a pattern or they're using uh, the, the first in, first out method, but they're not. Uh, we've seen uh, some come in after submission in as, as soon as four days, and uh, we've seen some go all the way up to the 88th or 89th day. Uh, you know, as, as Jason said, the SBA has 90 days to decision. Um, but by and large, uh, they're coming in faster than we anticipated, um, which is good for the, for the borrower. And... Um, I think out of the you know over a hundred we've received, uh, one has received 98% forgiveness, and the rest of them have all received 100% uh, uh, forgiveness. So that, that that is also a good thing. I guess I, I don't necessarily need to go through the application process uh, because uh, you know Jason kind of went through that as well um, with the you know, the, the different types of uh, applications that they have between the 3508S and uh, whether or not you use the 3508 or the EZ form. I will tell you from our experiences, uh, as soon as we submit an application uh, that's greater than uh, $2 million, we are uh, getting notification of the, um, the loan necessity questionnaire, um, which is the eight or nine page document uh, that, that Jason uh, and, and Alan alluded to. Um, it does, uh, you know, we, we get it almost immediately and the bank has, <clears throat> excuse me, the bank has five days to notify uh, and forward the document to the borrower. And again, um, the borrower has 10 days to, to complete it. Um, you know, it, it is comparing uh, the six month uh, 19 results to the six month 20 results. Uh, does have some liquidity measures in there, and the, you know, there's questions about whether or not they, you know, uh, they're in an industry that was uh, uh, affected or mandated to be shut down by any of the uh, local uh, or government agencies. So, 
uh, again, you, you do have 10 days, uh, so I would not sit on that process at all. Um, the last thing I, I would point out is a lot of other small businesses got the idle loans. And um, while you know we are seeing everything is 100% forgiven thus far from the SBA, um, they are deducting it, uh, the idle loan from that, which is again, a loan up to uh, $10,000. Um, and, and, you know, generally, uh, again, you'll get notified uh, from your bank. Uh, if you had an outstanding idle loan, you, you have the choice of uh, paying it off or amortizing it out through the balance of uh, the amortization period um, that, you, that you choose, whether it's three or five years under the PPP program. So uh, next slide. Uh, one of the uh, things that you know, I thought I would go through with some of, as you know, again, we've seen um, hundreds of applications uh, come through already, uh, and some of the uh, common errors that we're seeing that uh, I think it's easy to uh, to address and help speed up the process. Uh, I think a lot of the applications that we're seeing, they, they're coming in with the 941 uh, quarterly report from uh, on their payroll. Um, it's better to provide the actual payroll report for the period uh, provided. Um, you know, you can work with your payroll provider for that rather than just send in the quarterly. Um, you can give the specific eight or 24 week period that you're working with on your payroll, uh, have that cut and submit that in. And that again, speeds up the process uh, to have the, the actual payroll report from that specific period. Um, has been alluded to a couple of times, um, you know, if you are under $50,000, um, we are still seeing some come in on the EZ form, uh, the, the, you know, the 3508 EZ, um, I would urge you to use the S form. The S form from the bank's perspective under the regulations uh, does not need any verification from the bank. So as soon as we see an application and we're using a portal, like a, a, a lot of banks are using. So as soon as we go into the portal in the morning and we see that there's an S form, we just immediately uh, send that straight to the SBA. There's no verification. If you have the EZ form or the, the 3508, the bank has to go through all the documents that are included in there and verify that the information and that'll slow down the process. So if you're under 50,000, use the S form, we send it straight off to the SBA. Um, so that certainly speeds up the process. Uh, another one of the common errors, uh, there is a deduction allowed for operating expense, which oftentimes is uh, your lease payment. Um, they're just including in there, I pay $5,000 a month times you know, two months is $10,000. Uh, the SBA is requiring that if you're looking to deduct uh, a lease expense that you have supporting documents, so uh, which is basically a copy of your lease. So if you're deducting a portion of your lease as an expense, su uh, supply the, um, your lease agreement, uh, and that again will speed up the process. Uh, and, and you know, another one that we're seeing is the incorrect amount for owners. Uh, there's a limit on the, on the salaries. Oftentimes the owners have an annualized salary of over a hundred thousand. Uh, so just be careful uh, when including that amount that you're having the limit in there for the owner salary. You know, those are some of the things that we're seeing. Um, you know, again, it is uh, happening a lot faster than we thought uh, as far as payments coming in. Um, th there is uh, a lot of uh, chatter and, and, you know, our meetings with the SBA and whatnot, uh, that they're, they're just, they're having discussions about a third round. Um, you know, what that's going to look like, you know, no one knows, uh, but my guess is uh, there's going to be certainly some tighter qualifications. Uh, and it may mirror something, you know, some of the stuff, uh, the information they're looking for on the necessity form uh, for the loans over $2 million, where they're gonna be, you know, having some qualifications that, you know, will compare your, you know, 2020 results to 2019 results uh, as, as far as what the, what, what the third round may look like. So um, with that, uh, that's uh, essentially all I have right now. So we'll just open it up to questions. I know there were a few, Peter.
Yeah, there are. Uh, that was great, Chris. Thank you for that summary. I I'm going to start with a question that kind of drills down on Jason's description of the your bank has 60 days to process and the SBA has 90, right? Is that those are on top of each other, right? Those don't intersect. That's the bank alone has the 60 and then the SBA wants the bank submits. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. And so Chris just gave us some timing and Webster five may sort of have best practices here, right? And be really close to his clients. And they're really running at a, at a hundred percent, close to a hundred percent forgiveness and be pretty quickly in their turnaround. So I would, I would ask the others on the call, are you seeing um, slower processing at other banks? Is Webster five sort of outstanding at this or is that sort of what most banks you're hearing from most clients? Yeah. So I'd say I'm seeing varied results. I've seen some of the banks, um, especially some of the kind of more local banks able to, mm -hmm. you know, process this more quickly. I've seen with some of the bigger national banks, um, you know, the Bank of America's of the world citizens, uh, they, they're, they're processing it more slowly. And I think some of them are even outsourcing it. Um, kind of their review process to uh, actually to other accounting firms to review the applications for them as kind of a first pass um, and doing all that it just it takes time because it, it you know has to go through the bank to to the accounting firm kind of back I've seen more back and forth with our clients in those situations where, where there are questions um, you know follow-up questions in terms of additional information that's that's needed or clarification because the accounting firm doesn't know you know <laughs> doesn't know the borrower there isn't that relationship there um, so yeah, I, I've seen a lot of our clients wait a, at least a couple of weeks, you know, I'd say at least two to three weeks before they kind of get that notification from their bank. Mm -hmm. Sandra, are you seeing similar, yeah, slightly I slower at large? Yeah. Agree with Jason's point that the, you know, the community banks, the banks were, that have the relationships with the clients, they're, they're much quicker um, mm -hmm. at processing these applications. Okay, so we had one question and uh, the, the person wanted to clarify that their bank submitted their loan, uh, their approved, they, they approved it on their end, and that was in mid-September, and they just wanted to confirm that it's, if we found on our calendar that it's around now, right, mid-December, that they would be 90 days out. That's the pure SBA de deadline, and I forget who mentioned 80, one of the loans took 88 days, so you can sometimes go right up against that deadline. Is that yeah. Yes, if they if their bank submitted it in uh, mid September, then they should hear by you know certainly mid December. So I, yeah. I would say any day. Okay, and then, um, Alan, this was a, a question related to just for further clarity around um, sort of when you can claim uh, forgiveness. So if the applicant here's the question: if the application approval doesn't happen until 2021, then how should we account for them? at 2020 year end, if we anticipate 100% forgiveness, keep it on the books as a loan. Can you just kind of detail the, the proper treatment of that? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, again, under, under current law and based on the um, most recent guidance in the IRS, they're basically saying that if, if you can reasonably anticipate that your PPP loan will be forgiven, then on your 2020 tax return, you have to um, you know, treat that loan as though it was forgiven, even though it may not have already been forgiven, which means that you cannot claim a deduction for expenses that are um, essentially reimbursed by that loan. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, so if, with, without a legislative fix to, um, to, to address that issue, it would mean that you, you essentially are picking up an additional amount of income uh, you know, equal to what the uh, PPP loan amount is. Uh, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, there, you know, there, there is um, bipartisan support for a legislative fix to address that issue. Um, and it seems that it's a matter of timing in terms of when we actually see something to correct that. But as uh, people are doing their year in tax planning and look at, the, at their estimated taxes, you know, in many cases, we're saying, look, just to, you know, to, to be safe, you should probably assume that your PPP loan is going to be uh, re resulting in you having less uh, expenses that you can deduct on your 2020 return. 
which may mean you want to make safe harbor estimates based on your prior year tax to kind of um, you know plan for the worst, hope for the best. But um, uh, you know if we <clears throat> if we don't see a legislative fix come the March April timeframe, you know this is probably a good year to file an extension, and hopefully that we'll see something by the extended due date. You 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 would hope that we'd be able to get this fixed, you know, in the next, you know, few weeks, few, few months, but um, we've, you know, all seen how long it can take to get a legislative fix. Um, looking at the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, there was, a, you know, a couple things in that bill that um, needed uh, technical corrections, one of which was qualified improvement property, and that took close to three years for that to happen. So, you know, hopefully, uh, this issue won't take that long for Congress to, to fix it. Um, but at this point, uh, you know, it's, it's anybody's guess. Um, Can I just, one, one thing, you know, you may want to call, not, you know, I would suggest if you're a small business to call your Congress uh, representative. I mean, there is proposed language in the HEROES Act, which is, was uh, uh, introduced by the House to fix this. And, and to your point, Alan, it, it can take a very long time for Congress to fix things. But, you know, one thing that was fixed very quickly um, after the 2017 Tax Reform Act, there was language slipped in by the Senator, I think from South Dakota, that benefited uh, agricultural co-ops. It gave them an extra deduction. Um, and, you know, Congress saw that and, and it, it, it hurt, quite frankly, the large you know, Monsanto and Cargill, and, and that language was fixed very quickly uh, shortly after. So, you know, right. part of it is just being more active and, and talking to your, your Congress, a man or woman about this mm -hmm. change. Agreed, yep. So, go ahead, yeah. So while we're in the crystal ball uh, <laughs> right. projections, and I, and I know uh, uh, it becomes tougher, one, one of the questions submitted was, are there expectations of rules or processing changes when the uh, administration changes in DC? That's it. This <laughs> political prognostication to see in the future. Um, or, or do we think that much of this momentum to get something passed and get a lot of these elements of the law of the CARES Act clarified is really something that's going to be done before January 20th. I mean, I, I've seen on television people pushing for, for a lot of this stuff to be addressed before before the end of the year. What's, what are your sources telling you, uh, indicating, right? without giving an answer? What are you hearing? Right. Well, I, I, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of um, people in Washington that think, you know, if, um, if we Hopefully we'll we'll get you know some some form of, of another round of economic relief, and that as part of that bill there could be a legislative fix to the deductibility of PPP loan related expenses. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully that'll happen relatively soon. Um, and so, so um, you know, but uh, that's we it's it's really difficult to guess at the timing of that. Okay, um, but arguably you know we'll have a new Treasury Secretary and the people kind of setting people implementing right um these uh programs will will shift um yep so i guess it's hard to adjust to that until it happens yeah. um here's a question if a company got a ppp loan under fifty thousand and had no had not did not have to use the funds yet but anticipates it might still need those funds is there any downside to holding on to the funds and submitting for forgiveness and preparedness for that need arising. So I guess that's someone who's who qualified for the 50 under 50,000 loan, but their business has been doing well. So how, how do you treat that, whether they've used it or not? Well, I, I mean, under the 50,000, it, it's more, you know, the, there's not the detailed information that they're looking for. I'm assuming they still had some payroll expenses. Um, so, you know, I, I have them talk to their accountant and, and decide whether or not it makes sense to, you know, apply this year versus next year. Again, I mean, at this point, you're you're talking December, so you're probably not going to get the forgiveness until um, 2020 anyway. But I would certainly submit uh, for forgiveness. 
Yeah, and you know, one thing I would add on to that, because I've, I've gotten similar questions from my clients, re regardless of the, the dollar amount of their loan, where they've they've asked me, you know, I, you don't have to spend the exact, you know, the, the actual money that you received for your loan. Again, the, 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 you can apply for forgiveness as long as you spent, you know, you had eligible costs. So to Chris's point, even if they haven't spent that actual $50,000 loan that they got from their bank, inevitably they've had payroll costs in the, right. in the 24 weeks, they can still apply for forgiveness, whether they do it now or you know, later in 2021 is, is more of the question from a timing standpoint. But unless they have major concerns that, um, and this is less applicable if you're under $50,000, but you know, unless you have major concerns that the SBA is gonna come back and say, you didn't have an economic need for the loan, um, you know, just because you haven't needed to spend the actual money because you've had you know, positive cash flow doesn't mean that you can't apply for forgiveness as long as you had eligible costs that meet the criteria. Right. So I have, I have a lot of clients who technically still have their PPP yeah. loan sitting in a separate bank account. They haven't touched it just out of complete being completely conservative in, in case the SBA comes back and says that they can't get full forgiveness. Um, but they are still applying because they've had payroll costs and, and, and the eligible costs to, to cover the loan amount. But you know the good cash flow is why they think they haven't spent it, right? Because it's sitting there hermetically sealed and it's a separate, uh, separate account. Got it. Um, you know, a couple of questions came in uh, to emails uh, in emails, and both of them at the end of them said "correct" with a question mark. So I think people have a good sense of uh, what they want. Uh, there was a slide that said, and uh, Chris, you had mentioned um, hundred thousand dollars salary limits from ownership was one of the areas where there'd been some confusion and obviously some folks maybe didn't um, didn't submit that correctly. And I'd love to hear what they did submit, but this person was clarifying that that 100,000 salary limit is applicable to all employees, right? Not okay. just owners. Yes. But Chris, you had seen that as a, uh, being fumbled on the ownership side. What, what did that look like? What did mis people miss? not understand clearly. Yeah, I, I, it is across the board. There's a hundred thousand dollar limit for all employees, uh, but for whatever reason, when it discusses in the application format for the um, owner's salary, um, they were, you know, not inputting the information correctly. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, as far as I can go on that. Yeah, the other thing I would add to that, Peter, is, you know, the, the owners are subject to a different cap once you go beyond the eight-week period. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's still subject to the hundred thousand dollars, but when you go from eight to twenty-four weeks, for employees, you get the benefit of the prorated twenty-four weeks of hundred thousand uh, dollar compensation, which translates to a little over forty-six thousand dollars for each employee. That limit is not the same for owners. There's a lower limit for owners. So when you go beyond the eight weeks owners only get the benefit of two and a half months worth of the $100,000 uh, cap instead of 24 weeks. So they are capped at $20,833 as opposed to $46,000 for their employees. So that's, that's an error that I've seen very frequently with, with, my, with my clients is they've capped owners at the same $46,000 amount as their employees and they're subject to a, to a smaller limit. Smaller limit. Wow. I'm, I'm an owner, that's pretty ugly. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, someone wrote in here, owners are limited to two and a half months of their 2019 salary, 400K, whatever is less. Um, so question related to, um, it came in earlier. Um, I'd like to see a specific example of how employees and payroll numbers are included in form 3508, specific, specifically the calculations for pages four or five of the instructions. And so we're not going to bring pages four and five up onto the screen, but do you know exactly what they're referring to and how to, can we help someone with clarity on kind of understanding that? Yeah, I, I believe they're referring to, uh, to PVP schedule a, and my guess is, because this is a question I've gotten a lot is it, it requires you to break out your employees, um, in, in table one versus table two and the employees that go in table one, are any employees that were paid below $100,000 on an annualized basis in 2019, or any employees that are new in 2020, so they don't have, they didn't have 2019 wages. 
Um, and then anybody that is above that $100,000 annualized uh, compensation goes into table two. And a lot of my clients have gotten tripped up about that. And, and really the reason why it matters is because anybody who is above the $100,000 annualized compensation threshold, you don't have to do the analysis on a salary or wage reduction because they're above that limit. So even if you reduce their salary, you, you wouldn't have an impact on your forgiveness. You only need to do that analysis on the folks that are in table one because the SBA wants to make sure that you didn't take somebody's pay from $80,000 and drop it to $50,000 because COVID hit and you couldn't afford to pay them the full salary anymore. Got it, got it. Here's another question. Uh, we're a nonprofit with two additional large payrolls per year. One fell during the estimated timeline for the loan and they don't identify whether that was the eight or 24 week period. The other happens after that period. We include that second large payroll uh, how and how long do we wait to apply for forgiveness? Um, and you know, what, is there a reason for anyone to wait? This, that's sort of a two-part question. The second part is really, is there a reason? You mentioned 10 months from the time that it expires. Is there a reason to wait till then or there, is there really not a reason to wait till then? Anybody can kind of take that on the payroll one or uh, the second part. Uh, the, the one as it pertains to the, I saw the question about the uh, large, you know, they run two large payrolls. Um, you know, that's a pretty specific question. Uh, a little out of the box, I would, I would have that person, you know, work with their account and or their banker and, and reach out directly to the SBA. Uh, every bank um, has a liaison uh, with the SBA. Uh, and we reach out to them constantly uh, for kind of out of the box questions like this. And, and it might take them a day or two to respond back, but uh, they are fairly responsive. Uh, and, you know, I, I would just say, you know, work, work with uh, your banker. And I think, you know, Jason and Alan certainly have contacts with the SBA as well as, as you know, whoever their specific uh, CPAs are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with Chris. You know, I, I think this is one of the, you know, slightly gray areas where I've gotten this question from clients because, you know, they may have, um, you know, a significant profit sharing contribution that they do, you know, once or twice a year or, or, or bonuses. And essentially the question is, can you accrue the costs that were incurred during the period that you're not going to pay until after? And under the guidance, the answer is yes, you can, because you can take the benefit of costs that you actually paid or that were incurred. The issue becomes, you need to show that that those costs were paid kind of by their next scheduled date. And that becomes more difficult when you're talking about, you know, a profit sharing or a bonus as opposed to, you know, if, it, if it's just a payroll and you needed to accrue for, you know, the, the extra five days that were then paid out in the week after your cover period end, and that's more clear cut. Um, so I would agree. I would definitely say, you know, reach out to your bank because, if it's a significant dollar amount that's going to impact your forgiveness, you want to make sure you get their thought and the SBA's thought. Um, there may be some flexibility there, but at a minimum, you're going to need to wait to apply for forgiveness until you actually make that payment uh, because the SBA is going to need to, to see proof that you actually made that payment if you're accruing for costs during your covered period. Mm -hmm. um, so they would have to wait until that second big payroll hit. Uh, and then, and then consider applying for forgiveness and kind of prorating the right amount into their cover period. Um, and then one, one more, we're going to sneak a couple in before we hit the uh, uh, 10 o'clock hour. Are head counter salary reductions at the end of the CP or must they be recognized throughout the entire CP? So if, if you have a, a salary or wage reduction, it does need to, uh, you, you do have to take it over the entire covered period. I mean, that calculation um, in terms of your headcount is done based on the average headcount you had during your entire covered period compared to the two reference periods. And mm -hmm. then if you need to, you can utilize the safe harbor as kind of another backstop if you still had a reduction and you can look at you know, what your headcount was as of the date of your application or December 31st of 2020, whichever date is earlier. Um, 
but yeah, you need to do that analysis o over the entire covered period. Got it. And Sandra, do you, we, that, that question about sort of waiting to apply using that full 10 months or not, are you, we're mostly, most of our discussion has been around sort of getting the application in and trying to get it done quickly, right? Are there strategic reasons you're advising any clients to sit on it longer? I mean, before the recent IRS guidance, you know, my thought was, well, you can wait and then treat it as a loan and deduct the expenses. But, you know, the IRS has now said, no, you can't do that. So, no, I don't I don't think there's any certainly no tax reason to wait uh, to apply. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, Alan, you feel differently. Or... Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um... OK, so uh, we're at 10 o'clock. You know, I was going to ask it any last thoughts and I know everyone hesitates to make uh, prognostications about what our politicians in DC will do. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, we, we did mention, uh, but you also belong to trade groups and are paying a lot of attention to what, uh, what different organizations are lobbying for, right? So um, if there was a narrower um, sort of next act for, you know, mini cares act, uh, from 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 what you hear and read, um, where would that be aimed? It sort of be, you know, someone mentioned that it would be much tighter to um, businesses with with extreme needs, maybe those right who lost fifty percent of revenues or that kind of thing. Any thoughts or um, uh, sharing of what your trade organizations are saying about where uh, something like that might be directed? I just, you know, I don't have, the, you know, I would say. There is language in the HEROES Act that fixes the, um, you know, this this IRS ruling pronouncement that mm -hmm. expenses are not deductible, and you know you could certainly pass that as a technical correction, get it done. Um, so I, I would suggest if you are a member of a trade organization to to lobby for that change. Got it. Got it. Anyone else want to uh, uh, use their crystal ball? <laughs> it's, it's a tough chair to be in. Well, listen, this was, we really uh, held on to a, 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 a large number of folks. I think there's a tremendous amount of interest in, uh, in uh, this topic. And um, someone asked earlier if the slides were available. I think we're planning on posting this whole presentation online so it can be watched again. I don't know if we're going to make, uh, we can check. If, if some of the slides are available, we'll, we'll check with you afterwards. We'll have an email out to all attendees and we'll share the contact information of our presenters as well as any uh, um, collateral stuff. And the person who um, had asked a question about page four and five was looking for some illustration. So if some, if there, maybe we could find uh, in your resources, you know, some sample forms and kind of share that out with uh, either the whole audience or with that individual, I can help uh, get them that answer. But listen, it's been terrific having all of you on. Thank you for uh, being part of the, uh, what hopefully is one of our wrap ups on uh, sessions on PPP funding. Hopefully most of those clarifications that are needed uh, happen in the next uh, couple of weeks here. I wanna thank our presenting sponsors, Webster Five and Fallon Health. Our panelists, Sandra O'Neill uh, from Bowditch and Bowie, um, Alan Osmolowski and um, uh, Jason Correa from Bloom Shapiro and Chris Watson for his third session of uh, helping us through the PPP maze. Uh, thank you and Webster Five for uh, joining us and um, have a great morning, everyone.